Thank you, everyone, for uh, being part of this really fantastic day. I think that we're seeing the birth of an industry. This is a very difficult thing. You know, just station period is <laughs> is a tough one. I want to thank my panelists, and I realize that we are the only thing standing between us and the end of the meeting. So, uh, as a small site, it comes with its own issues and problems. And what I'd like to do is first have uh, the Chowanke Foundation talk about their work at Wiscasset, with which you've heard, then Rick Armstrong from TDEC will talk about the work they're doing. Uh, we have a homeowners association preliminary permit on the Kennebec, I'll say a few words. And then Matt Lewis will talk about uh, the kinetic energy project that they have here with the Passamaquoddy tribe and, and with Randy Goodhue. I'm gonna let each of you say a few words about yourself if you'd like or just go forward. So Tom? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Tom Twist, uh, and that's truly my name. Uh, and I am the uh, sustainability officer uh, for the Chuanke Foundation. And uh, just a couple words about, for those few of you who don't know what the Chuanke Foundation is, we're primarily an educational facility. Uh, but we've got this wonderful kind of um, wing where we do a lot of different types of renewable energy. And we try to connect uh, those renewable energies uh, with the general public. So we're kind of like a loudspeaker uh, for interesting new technologies. Um, Joanna did a really nice presentation on uh, the Wiscasset site. Uh, Peter Arnold uh, was really the project manager uh, behind that. And I um, am the lucky recipient of a lot of his work uh, at Wiscasset. And uh, I'm going to be really brief about uh, the project because uh, uh, the technical aspects have already been covered. But what I want to say is that uh, I think the, the theme of this meeting has been collaboration. And uh, I think the Wiscasset project was a real uh, textbook case of uh, a nice collaboration, uh, probably as evidenced by the fact that most of you in this room have worked on it in some aspect or another. Uh, so that's it's kind of nice. And uh, even though uh, in the end we did not get the velocities that we were hoping for, I think it was hopefully a nice uh, transferable, um, uh, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but uh, a transferable uh, technique for other small sites to use. So a really logical way to go about looking to see if your site makes sense uh, for going forward with, with title. And um, there's been renewed uh, interest in the site, which is great. And uh, perhaps in the future, we could uh, indeed act as a, as a testing site for, for new technologies. So. So that's Wiscasset. Thank you. Can I get the, I just have a couple of pictures. You want to do that? <laughs> okay, go. You're taking away my five minutes. Uh, Rick Armstrong, I'm a head of the Tidal Energy uh, uh, Demonstration Evaluation Center at Maine Maritime Academy. Uh, that's just a little bit power of the oceans, how to make this thing move. I guess just at that. Yeah, there we go. Um, just want to go quickly what TDAC is, uh, we originally were more uh, commercially oriented, now we're basically a test site, and I think uh, with a name like Armstrong, I can get away with this, that's my real name too, uh, <laughs> that uh, we're the missing link instead of, the, uh, we're the bagpipes, we're the missing link between noise and music. What we really are, I think what TDEC is developing into, that missing link in ORPC, John Furlan spoke well of it in a meeting we had down at the Maine Technology Institute in January, saying that if there was a possibility the developers had a way of physically testing their units in the real world, regardless of not environmental impact, but a model, a field model in the real world, before they began to take that through the permitting process, before they started taking that device uh, into the, uh, the location where they wanted to and going through all that, taking it from the tow tank, if you will, into some way that we could uh, uh, look at that device as a, as a field model, that that would advance the process and at the same time help the regulatory community look at it. And so uh, TDIC has kind of filled that slot. We've morphed from being uh, originally an effort to have a commercial installation uh, coupled with Maine Maritime Academy and the Bagadoos River really into a testing center. Um, our mission, very simply, is provide a full permit, fully permitted first class 
testing facility. We have those permits. We are fortunate to receive a special ruling from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on this. Also working with uh, Dana Mersch, originally at DEP, on a letter of notification operation that has worked well for us. Uh, Jay Clement out of Army Corps. Again, it's the cooperation and the yes thing again. I can't say enough being one of the uh, regulators at some point, which is the dark part of my life, but I won't say <laughs> any part of that, you know. Um, anyway, uh, uh, he was very... Uh, effective with uh, NOAA people and we got the fisheries thing squared away. So we're, we're at a certain scale, but yet we're permitted. We have the freedom to move forward. The second part of our mission certainly is to develop the environmental protocols. We're sort of that third party open to be able to let regulators come in, take a look at what we're doing, how we're doing it, and help through that process. And I think finally this industry, if we're really going to develop an industry, we want to develop an industry that has something to do with jobs, something to do with sustainability, and something to do with economic development. And really what we're looking for at Maine Maritime Academy, a good sledgehammer operation that we are, is get the kids out there to be the maintenance, and that has already come up with the ORP thing, to do the maintenance, to do the technical kind of jobs of getting them in the water and purpose-built boats, etc. Through a uh, main tidal power initiative, we're able to have the support to go forward with those missions and more particularly to identify, quote, small sites within the Bagaduce River. And the support came through us, the Chewankee efforts at Wiscasset, and we're the ones that, with Tom again, are exploring Wiscasset to see if we can envelope that under the FERC permit on the testing level because, again, the conclusion was it didn't have the, the robust resource, but it may be just a real practical laboratory. And uh, at the end, we'll hear more from uh, Roke Island to our east. The same kind of thing. What this industry needs is a really practical hands-on laboratory. Uh, so we're working on that. The testing facilities, and I just want to uh, we've got uh, four sites identified within the Bagaduce River from low, low flow, very close, very accessible to the academy to up into a uh, more robust site and higher energy. That's at the academy, uh, uh, the harbor site, I mean, the, the dock site, we have the harbor site, which I think shows what we're trying to demonstrate there, not only of somewhat higher flows, but also the coexistence of devices with a very commercial harbor, lots of things going on, lots of competitive uses. And then we get up into the narrows and a couple of sites up there where it's far more robust. Uh, we've done a little work already in testing. Uh, we develop a test platform. Maine Blue Stream Power was able to demonstrate their device uh, with us, and we developed some protocols on that. Uh, that's the test barge. That's the unit underway. And we've been working also, Rich Kimball's been very helpful, with the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, uh, looking at a device. It's a pump-up system, and there's some of that going on as well. And I think they're going to come up and uh, do some work with us as, uh, in the future. Uh, special thanks again. I mentioned M MTPI, which has been incredibly supportive of us and allowed us to extend ourselves in ways to get our permits, to get our mission finally uh, arms around that, and to get those sites identified, characterized, and permitted, which was big. But that kind of learning, I think, is scalable to others as well. And it gives Maine, I think this is really important, it gives Maine a fully permitted site, no questions asked, as opposed, I shouldn't say New Hampshire, but I will, um, <laughs> that, uh, that we're all set to go and go forward and really build on that. And the second part of this, we're able to then go further with this with a group of people uh, in the industry. Uh, Ryan was involved in that. I missed him. Where'd he go? Um, oh, there he is. Uh, uh, involved in that process that so we were uh, just awarded uh, $483,000 by Maine Technology Institute as a collaborative to move forward on this. Of half of that money will be to provide uh, resources to build a really good test platform rather than a couple of stolen uh, floats from the academy. So life's improving. Um, we thank you for that and uh, any questions whenever the case may be. Moving on. And Dot Kelly, uh, part of the Pleasant Cove Homeowners Association on the Kennebec River. I'd like to take a moment and to thank Mick and the whole group within UMaine. 
I think that people have really stretched out and taken a holistic view of how can this be good, good for our society because it's not petroleum based and it's not CO2 producing. Um, it's looking to alternative energies that are sustainable and yet things have impacts. And so we have to look out for the impacts on the waterways, on other users, on the fishes, on, on the seals and um, on the other active participants, the people who want to make a buck, which is good. That's our system here. And how do you do that? Other researchers. So it is collaboration. And I came to the party because of my background in uh, environmental and energy, thinking I'd done a bunch of permitting and maybe it's the permitting and those regulators that we just don't have a process that's set up for small sites and a process that's set up for hydrokinetic as opposed to dams. And what I've come away from it is, no, they get it. <laughs> you know, they know that the regulations were made for dams and that these are not dams. And yet there, as uh, was said before, there are still issues that we want to be looking out for. And so the site on the Kennebec, which is at the Kennebec Narrows, has water similar to the Wiscasset site. So we actually funded some of the Wiscasset uh, velocity studies because you need to know, does the equipment that exists right now, will it, will it give us anything? And so at least for right now, I would say that that's one of the big issues facing the small sites. Do you have a site that the equipment's not designed and developed, but for the, for the equipment that's here, can we you know, think that we're going to have a success? And I want to say that that's probably where the Kennebec Narrow site is. We did get a subsequent preliminary permit application, and what that requires is every six months you say how things are doing. New Maine has been so supportive. They put an acoustic monitor in the area so we could see what kind of endangered species that are tagged, are, are trans, uh, trans, whatever, transit, transiting, transiting the area or hanging out in the area. It's actually very an area that seems like <laughs> some some of the fishes like to even just hang in. <laughs> but with the next step for the preliminary permit will be should we. Should we do a current study or should we just know that this is another one of those small sites that may be able to move the ball forward? And I'd, I'd like to leave it as saying that this is such an exciting area and there's always hiccups in the road. I can hear that RPC has a lot of successes. I'm sure there's plenty of hiccups that you're going to push through. And as I look around these faces, I would say reach out and ask for help if we can be of any because you've got a you know, really supportive crowd hoping that we can find the success. So what I would like to do next is just pass it on to Matt Lewis to talk about the opportunities that he's seen and the experiences you've had so far. Hi, I'm Matthew Lewis. I'm the executive manager for Sabiac Energy, which is the Passamaquoddy Tribe's renewable energy company. Uh, the tribe is very um, interested and I would say also concerned with um, maintaining the environment and being good stewards of the land. Um, so renewable energy and, and, and managing our natural resources uh, intelligently is very important to the tribe. Um, we do a bunch of stuff. I'm trying to put my title hat on here. Uh, we uh, permitted a site, uh, two sites, I believe in 2009, and I believe we took that away from ORPC at the time, uh, but we uh, found that the sites and the developer we were working with didn't didn't have the technology to harness the the flow that was at that, that were at those two sites so we uh, forfeited them to orpc and um have since then uh reevaluated uh what we want to do in the in the area and we're looking to half moon cove and the causeway that connects eastport and perry uh, we are working with the Army Corps of Engineers to breach that causeway and uh, open that up to uh, the tidal flow there. And there's a lot of uh, environmental impacts that we have to consider. Uh, mainly the, 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 the construction of the causeway in the 30s 
uh, backed up that cove and put a lot of silt in that area and opening up that causeway would um, essentially flood the the bay with with all that silt and possibly suffocating a lot of the the, uh, the scallops and ground fish in the area so there's a lot of environmental factors we're considering and um, hopefully with the grant that we receive from UMO we can uh, do some studies and, and hopefully uh, have a game plan um, so right now, at the, the, the process that we're at is, is basically uh, uh, looking to get a prototype uh, in the water and do some monitoring of that area and uh, some of the uh, estuaries also that feed into uh, uh, Western Passage we want to we wanna take a look at and monitor. And I believe that's all I have as far as my title goes. Thank you, Matt. And Randy, if I could have you Talk about Roark Island. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. And uh, my name is Randy Goodhue, and I am the chairman of the Roark Island Gardner Homestead Corporation, one of two homesteads in the state of Maine. Um, it's a privately owned archipelago of islands down in Chandler and Englishman's Bay. And it's been in the family uh, for over 200 years, uh, actually purchased in 1806. Um, we were off the grid up until 1976, so we have, uh, how does that work, uh, close to 170 years of being off the grid. We went on the grid, we've been on the grid now for 36 years, and uh, our cable is wearing thin, and uh, so we need to think about uh, the, the longer term, and uh, long term uh, is, is exactly that in our case. Um, we have been very involved uh, in conservation and environmental issues at Roke. We've worked uh, uh, with uh, uh, numerous uh, folks in the, at the University of Maine uh, for years, uh, working with undergraduate and graduate students, uh, internship programs. We have a year-round farm. Uh, we have uh, uh, a staff of uh, eight people year-round and sometimes up to as many as 20 people are on the island at any one time. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, made significant efforts to, uh, in terms of uh, community outreach. And um, uh, when we were thinking about uh, the future of uh, um, the energy supply to the island, uh, we uh, obviously looked at the alternatives and renewables. And I reached out to, to Mick and uh, uh, was flattered to have him respond by asking us to join this initiative, which we are thrilled to be part of. Well, one of the problems uh, that we have, or at least I have, is how do we uh, give as opposed to take? Um, what purpose can we, uh, what can we do for the initiative uh, as, on, as opposed to only benefiting from the results of the initiative? And um, I've, I've talked to this to a number of you, uh, as well as to Mick, and um, uh, we're, uh, we've decided that one of the best things that we can do, if interested, uh, is to offer, offer ourselves up as a, as a laboratory, uh, as an enthusiastic supporter of the initiative, and a group that is anxious to work uh, in collaboration uh, with, with other small sites uh, participants in particular. Um, well, a good example, uh, Anna DeMeo uh, from the College of Atlantic uh, has been down and uh, for the last year or so has been working on um, this uh, monitoring and control system of our energy usage uh, on, the, uh, on the property. And um, albeit a very small scale project, uh, she uh, is in, uh, very encouraged with the results, which has led to all sorts of uh, technological applications and, 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 and scientific information that hopefully will help uh, Matt in his effort. Uh, and I understand that Anna is going to be going up there and taking this technology, uh, this monitoring and control technology, up to, the, uh, um, up to his site to determine um, uh, the need uh, uh, which is just as important as the source of, of the resource. So um, uh, we're thrilled to be part of this initiative. Again, uh, if, if, if you're all interested in, in how uh, or have an idea as to how we can help, uh, we're anxious to do so. Thank you very much.
Thank you, panelists. I'd like to open it up to any questions that you might have. I just have a comment um, observing all the presentations today, especially regarding small sites. It, it seems to me, and I think you discussed it on the way up, that one of the one of the um, key issues and, and roadblocks to figuring out these uh, small sites is getting to what the resource is early. Uh, you know, that has taken some time in some of these cases, and often, if you knew that answer early on in the process, it would save a lot of time. Uh, and it seems that the velocity is like one of the key things to know right away. It's like, do we have enough to even go for it? And that's not an easy thing to measure. Um, it seems to me that would be something that um, being able to measure that quickly and characterize that quickly to make a determination might be something that could be very beneficial to small sites. So we actually, uh, I, I think and I were talking about this at lunch, uh, one of the things that we did do, uh, uh, one project that we assigned to graduates at the University of Maine, Machias, was to do exactly that. Now this work is, is, is outdated, um, but uh, we have, and I think I sent it to you, Mick, uh, the results of this uh, thesis that was done by a, a, a postgraduate at the University of Maine in terms of addressing that very issue. It's, what is, this, uh, what is the resource around this particular archipelago? Uh, we have one of the oldest and longest uh, uh, mill dams uh, in the state, and we're uh, uh, kind of uh, working with uh, Bud Warren uh, uh, from that institute. Uh, but uh, as we look at that uh, history, we think that's the place to put uh, a new site, uh, and, and yet, uh, besides the fact that maybe we don't want to uh, rebuild the dam, um, uh, there's actually probably a more attractive site around the corner in Chandler's Bay. And the question is, Mick, and I didn't even ask you this, is that do we begin to uh, approach Jones Port or some other potential users? And again, going back to uh, somebody's comment early on the earlier panel about working together uh, and, and, and forming some kind of a coalition of different interest groups uh, to pursue this. But to your point, obviously, the velocity is critical. And so as we think next steps, uh, that sounds like a perfectly good one. What's a protocol for a down and dirty, uh, quick velocity, and what is the cutoff? You know, is it two meters per second? It might be two meters per second right now, and, and that could then separate some of the wheat from the rest. Yes. I don't think it's as simple as that. Good. I, I, you know, and, and Gerald would probably be better to address this, but. You know, velocity has to hit these things at a certain angle and at a certain amount of time. And, and I don't think simple velocity or simple depth, of, it, it is not a simple process. And it may be very uh, technology specific. You know, our type of turbine may be far more forgiving uh, of some of these uh, locations. Uh, and a propeller type might be more forgiving in other places. So I, I don't think it's a simple answer about, I don't think velocity is a simple parameter. I guess my suggestion is really just to, if the velocity is not there, do you want to go further? I mean, probably not. Either. Right, so I'm just saying, to kind of mitigate how much effort you put into evaluating a site, you know, should the protocol be, let's go out and see what the velocities are, maybe just a very global snapshot in the area, is there any potential there? And these issues of like local variation and things like that, those would be like, I'd say, if I were studying, say, yeah, we've got two and a half meters per second. Let's see what the distribution is now. Let's put more money into figuring out what the distributions are. But if it's like half a meter per second, you might say, well, that's not a It's a non-start. Yeah, so that's merely my suggestion. And we don't have the resources right now to do that quickly and efficiently. I guess one of the questions I had for all of you is, 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 this, is tidal power really a, uh, an economical answer to small site uh, needs? Um, I don't know if I'm convinced, that, and if I'm not, it's only because I don't know enough. Um, but I always I mean, witness the project which just, you know, we just saw so much of it and it's been so successful. That's a, a relatively large scale project, even though you're going to talk, take take the 50 turbines instead of one, three rows. How do you address a small site where you've got half and half of that, or even less, and, and lots of them up and down the coast in this quote unquote viable area? Is it, 
Is it feasible? Yes. Yes. Who said yes? That was Gerald. Let me, I'm Gerald McAfee, I'm the Chief Technology Officer and Vice President of Engineering for OPC. And I think there's, there's many different elements to the question you're asking. That's, again, as Herb was saying, it's not a simple question. The technology that we look at utility scale tidal turbines is a large capital cost. There will be a large capital cost. The installation and maintenance of those devices is a significant expense. Um, mobilization of assets to install devices, uh, well, it's a, it a million dollars, a, a million dollars of mobilization costs for a particular parts from the Gulf of Mexico. Right. Um, you know, those are obviously inconsistent with community scale small uh, uh, devices. There are people in the industry making small devices, five kilowatt, 10 kilowatt turbines that are intended specifically for small sites. And they, they, the intent is to make many of them so that the manufacturing scale drives down cost. The question I'd have for people here is that, you know, I, I think there's a technical solution, but I'm not seeing the regulatory path to installing a small turbine in a site like Wisconsin or Brooklyn. And, and why? Because I think, and, and, you know, Herb should talk to this, but the licensing process that we have today is very much geared around the larger projects. And I don't see, I'm not sure if there's going to be a path or if there's some exemption that's been considered for something of the order of, I think, what you're considering. And so I just go back to laying cable. Oh, no, I think you know, you've got a fantastically interesting little project of how to make an island self sustaining. I think there's lots of great technical solutions. Yeah, and it's not just ours. I mean, you yeah. know, this is, uh, especially along the coast of Maine, there's got to be one island after another. But if we had the right solution, it could be universally applied up and down the coast, whether it's a, com and probably it's a combination. Yes, of it's not going to be just tidal power. It's going to be right. some wind, some well, tidal, yeah. some solar. We've already, we've already executed the solar, um, and actually we're doubling the arrays that we have, and that's been extremely beneficial in a very short period of time, and we pursue that. I understand I had the same issue with small scale wind. That too is not very economical. Um, so it's this small scale issue, of both on the technological and the regulatory. I mean, but I guess as, as we get more acceptance at this, at the larger scale level, it becomes uh, it's almost like uh, Apple's uh, screens in reverse and going from small to big. <laughs> but anyway, yes, sir. I was just going to add a compliment to what this gentleman said. There, there seems to have been some progress on the small MUK uh, hydrokinetic devices. And, and the, the progress is, if it really turns out, somehow they have arbitrarily decided that 5 megawatts is sort of a break point. Less than 5 megawatts classified as small projects. It's not cast in stone, but there's been some writings in the publications from the regulatory agencies, and that number is being bantered around. So the significance would be once you've made a dividing line definition, large, small, or small, medium, large, now you have a framework in which to tailor the regulations to something less than, say, the five megawatts, which seems to be the current talking point for the, you know, division, which is very healthy. And the second point, I mean, I'm not the only one saw it, but Perk and Bowery just wrote a nice outline, collective outline, it was uh, on News All Energy, I don't know if it was published elsewhere, but uh, those two agencies, you know, a very obvious collaboration, what I would call a very business friendly, I don't know, four or five pages, whatever it was, with directions on who to call and when to call and all these kinds of things, They're very helpful. That's progress. Yeah, yeah, I wonder if there's, um, from the regulatory side, if there's been any talk of, of making like a, a permit by rule um, set of regulations for micro turbines. Something like Roke Island size, where, where maybe Roke Island would need, a, say, a 50 kW turbine, or, or maybe even smaller. Well, so, it, and just kind of to give a, a comparison for that, 
you know, if you in the wind industry, unless you have town regulations and you're under 100 feet, you just put it in your backyard. Right. And there is, on the freshwater side, there is a, a micro hydro uh, permitting process. Okay. Um, in in tidal situations, because this is is such a new new in terms of regulatory environment, new um, kind of project. We haven't got that far yet. Um, and certainly, I mean, it'd be something for us to consider. Yeah. And I would, like I said, we're in the process of hiring a new Dana. Uh, but that would be a good thing to talk to that person about. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be any permits. It's just that right. for something like Broke Island, right. you know, it's... And, and certainly, I mean, I came from the land background, and you know, wetland spills and stuff like that, and we have permit by rule for all kinds of different projects. And, and that's a good idea for a, for a small site. You could, you know, separate out some areas where, no, you can't do permit by rule because of these resources, and these areas you can um, and your structure has to be X, Y, and Z for size and things like that. There could also be seasonal. I mean, for instance, if there's something you know that you're you're right. aware of that utilizes, for instance, like I was always saying, our, our cove is utilized by a, a, two very large groups of seals for mating season. Mm -hmm. um, in the spring and throughout most of the summer, they're not there. You know, they are migratory. Yeah. So. You know, if you, if I, I personally have thought about installing what I kind of named as a, a personal. <laughs> uh, let me just give you my little uh, a acronym here. It's your uh, personal tidal flow turbine design. <laughs> so it's your PTFTD. <laughs> but it would have to be something that would utilize something more like the um, woman from uh, Humane, where it had you know a suction. Uh, mounting where you yeah. could put it in and take it out with a lot of without mm -hmm. a lot of machinery but you could do it so that you were respectful to migrating communities of animals mm -hmm. there's certainly all kinds of options out there yeah um, isn't that great <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the hard part from a regulator standpoint is to go to something like a permit by rule process you have to kind of define the whole realm and then set standards for that whole realm. Or you take a very small subsection of that realm and define parameters for that small subsection. You can't, and with, there's too many different permutations on that. For At, at this point, I can't get my, my brain wrapped around it enough to be able to say I could write a permit my rule program. Well, if I could be a cheerleader, I think that we're still in the, we're crawling and we're trying to walk. And so actually the thing to do is to say, here's a project, we want to move forward, let's gather us together, let's talk about it, let's see if we can find a way to make it to the end line. And maybe it will get stopped, maybe it won't, but we need those experiences to figure out what the parameters need, need to be. And if there's one last question, Otherwise, I want to thank you for hearing from the small sites and I want to thank you all for coming. We're, we, we're, we, we've run a little bit over time and I apologize because I know a lot of you had a long drive. Uh, we, yeah, I assume everybody signed in before you left. I, I really appreciate having you here and look forward to a continuing dialogue. So thank you very much, especially those of you who traveled a long way. So thank you.